Uh, all right, guys. Oh, okay. oh, man, this is a big one. This is a, a big one, but I mean, like, I actually have some good ideas of shit we can ask him. Hell yeah. Like, I know that none of us. I, okay, didn't watch didn't watch any of these movies. Me neither. Me neither. I, yeah, no. I was watching Friday Night Lights again. But, like, we saw the one, we talked to him four years ago, and I, like, listened to some of that episode. But I, I think there's some, like, shit we could ask him that would be really funny uh, and cool. I got this one. Uh, who is more important to the left, Vladimir Lenin or Gritty? <laughs> That's okay, good. Good, good. That's good. Good writing that down. Yeah, I mean, yeah, some, get some that, good stuff there. Put that in the dog. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking like it'd be funny if we just ask him if he knows uh, what up dog is, and that, then if he yeah. says, what, and if he says what's up dog, we can just like be like, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a cla- that's a joke right there. He, we could fucking uh, that one gets good over on him real good with that one. And I think that's like with those two, that's like about 15 minutes. I think we can get like 35 minutes even. I might be being a little ambitious here, but. Should we be like, you know, Mr. Curtis is a hot dog, a sandwich? That would be great, right? Yeah. I mean, like, uh, like the, the, the sandwich planners thought that it would just be meat between two pieces of bread. But then something strange happened that they couldn't predict when people on the Internet started saying that sort of, sort of a tubular meat in, in, in a bread-like bun was also a sandwich. Okay, good, done. Check, I would check like to off. know what he thinks about uh, Jonathan Shape getting corn cobbed. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, I have a dude, I just got a fucking gold mine of questions we can answer or ask him. Uh check this out. Without saying the city itself, where are you from? Okay. We yeah. could, uh, uh, what's your favorite breakup song? I mean, I yeah, I mean like I understand like it's 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 a podcast, it's an audio medium, but maybe we could ask him like um without downloading any new photos, like Adam, like well, what are four yeah. characters that's your vibe? Yeah. Without downloading any new pictures. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, here's a great question. I think he'll like this one. What song did you find had a darker meaning after reading the lyrics? All right, yeah, yeah I mean, that's like, really his again. type of question. Yeah, so he's like, but but then, but then something strange and dark happened when I listened to that song. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm hearing it in my head right now. I would like to know what uh, his vibe is using the last three images saved on his phone. That's a good one. I, I, I've been uh, sort of involved in the mentally ill astrology community lately, and uh, I was wondering if I could ask him: Is it true that seven? Or seven times four equals twenty eight has the same energy as Thursday, and it's a Pisces. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I think, think this is like an hour. Actually, I mean, it's an hour. Look, if we if we if we run out of time, we feel like we're spinning our wheels. Like I've been watching a lot of the OC lately uh, for the first time ever, Ooh. actually, and I just like I have. I want to know if he thinks like I do that Seth Cohen represents like the poisoned decadence of a failing Western culture. Okay. Yeah. All right. I cool. think we got it. Chris, did you write all those down? I didn't write any of them down. Yeah. And if I can just add one, I would be curious just based on his past output, uh, if he thinks that uh, Anya Taylor Joy's Golden Globes look uh, served an iconic style or if Jason Sudeikis stole the show with his tie dye hoodie. Yeah, okay, I yeah. think honestly, I, I, I hope he's as mad as I am about the, the fucking double standards for how men yeah. can accept awards and what women have to dress like. Jason Sudeikis looked like a, looked like trash. Oh man, that reminds me. If we have time, we should show him that uh, WandaVision thing where the robot says that. Uh, oh grief is yeah, like yo, the like price you pay for love or something. Yo, I, yo, let's see if he'll say just like fuck under his breath. Yeah, and like <laughs> we, we, we drop that yeah. on him. Why did I even that bother like, making this filmmaker. goddamn movie? Yeah, yeah. We yeah. Should, yeah. Do you want to see the angst that wants to hang out for like a few hours after to watch WandaVision with us? Okay, I would yes. actually like yeah. to know yes. what his take on WandaVision yeah. would be. Because I presume yeah. he's never seen the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah. I think it'd be I mean, pretty it's, funny. It's, I mean, it's like, it's like a, you know, like it's like classic television, but on freaking crack. It's, yeah. it's like, it's Lynchian. You know what I mean? Like, I think yeah. there's a lot of shit there that like vibes with, with whatever it is that this, I think this new would, series is about. I think he would love it. Okay. Cool. I mean, oh, sh- oh dude, he's calling right oh, now. Fuck. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, all right. All right. Let's all right. Go. Game, Sorry. Face. Okay. game face. Game mode. Yeah, game mode. Game mode. Let's get you know, game right, face, game guys. Mode. Game face. Let's go. Let's, Let's go. It. Let's get this money. And it's four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Oh.
Uh, welcome to the show, everyone. It's uh, me, Matt, and Felix with you, and along with a very special guest today. Um, now, the last time we had this guest on, Trump had just become president, and we had uh, begun a four-year journey to see just how insane he could make everyone. Now, Biden is president, and we're all assured that the worst has been prevented from happening, and things can go back to normal. Despite this, on the left and right, basically everybody feels defeated, exhausted, and most importantly, like nothing we say or do has any effect on the politics that govern us or how our lives are playing out. Catastrophes keep happening and daily evidence mounts up that absolutely no one in charge wants to or even can do anything to help. There's a sense of paralysis among both the people and the powerful that nothing can seem to change. In the age of the individual, none of us seem to be able to get out of our own heads. Well, at least there is a new film series that attempts to explain just how we got here. Adam Curtis, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Adam, at the end of our very last, our last interview four years ago, you posed a question that has stayed with me or haunted me, you might say, ever since then. It was essentially, you asked, do you really want change? Because real change requires the possibility that you yourself will also be changed. This new series, Can't Get You Out of My Head, An Emotional History of the Modern World, uh, seems to me to be a continued exploration of that question. So, Adam, what is it that all of us can't seem to get out of our own heads? I mean, I would still ask you that same question today, actually. <laughs> yeah. Is do you really want change? Because it seems to me what marked out those four years you've just talked about was, on the one hand, inside everyone's heads was continual chaos, fury, hysteria on both the left and the right. But actually, if you look at what happened during those last four years, both in your country and in mine, in real terms, actually nothing happened. Hmm. None of what Trump promised happened. He promised to come in and get rid of the corruption in Washington. He would drain the swamp. He promised to end the, the, the horrible foreign wars that were killing people needlessly. Uh, he promised to bring the factories back. Uh, he promised to build a wall. None of that happened. So he failed completely. Yet at the same time, th those who opposed Donald Trump and those who opposed Brexit in my country failed to come up with an alternative which has, to put it bluntly, changed the world. And so we're sort of back where we started, which makes me, just, just as a sceptical journalist, what was all that about then? If they didn't manage to change anything, either side, no, I'm not talking just about the left and the liberals. I'm talking about the right as well. They both failed. Why? And is it? And the, the the question I set out to answer in these films is: Is it something to do with the fear of change, or is it something that they didn't understand about change? And I, that's what I wanted to examine. Well, we'll talk about the the whole history and a lot of things you go into here. But just as a one recent event, um, as kind of an aside. Uh, how annoyed are you that um, I'm presuming that this series was pretty much in the can before you could edit in video footage of the uh, Capitol Hill storming of just people breaking into Congress to overthrow a corrupt government and then basically just kind of walking around live streaming themselves, taking selfies and whatnot? Because when I saw that on CNN, I could just hear Aphex Twin or Nine Inch Nails or some vague industrial ambient music in the background. I would have probably put uh, old traditional Muzak in it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yakety sax. I mean, I mean, I could have edited it in. Um, I didn't because I thought that, in a way, what was really interesting about that was the hysterical reaction to it. Um, yeah. I mean, that is not to say that it wasn't a very sad moment because people died, and and that's horrible. And it was, it was a sort of very sad sense of something having gone completely wrong. I mean, what I really thought about it, but I, but I, I, I didn't want to, to do it because then you get caught by the Trump trap, which is what, to be honest, I think all liberals do, is that actually really what it represented was something terribly sad also on the part of the people who were protesting. I saw it from my perspective, my country or my society as... People who four years before believed, as I said just now, Trump was going to really change things and he hadn't done anything. And they were there was a sort of sad fury to it all. So when they got in there, they didn't even really trash it. They just wandered around between the guide ropes and it felt, as well as the sadness of people being killed, it also felt that they realised they had failed too. And 
I just thought there was a melancholy to it, really. I mean, to be honest, as I watch your country from here, I see a terrible melancholy on both sides, that they've just both given up now. They, they don't yeah. know how yeah. to change things. Uh, and, and, and there's just a sort of, I don't know, a slump. And, and, and they're waiting for something new. I, I, that's how I see it. it. It's sort of over here feels like it's, we're just, the empire is just a beached whale. And we're all, everyone's trying to do CPR on it and doesn't know how. Like one way or the other, the Trump thing is we have to revive Fortress America. We have to, we'll no longer occupy countries in this way we used to. We'll just go in and take shit and leave in like some sort of, in some imitation of how empires behaved 200 years ago. And then, yeah, on the other side, there's a desire to recreate the Dulles Brothers Mafia. The same people who had a hysteria over uh, January 6th, I mean, they were thrilled by it in a way because it got to be their 9-11. And the same way that Bush got to create the super modern deep state, they would be able to recreate like, yeah, the Dulles Mafia in the vision of the liberal world order. Everyone was just thrilled to portray weakness and sadness in front of the entire country. Yes, it it, it was weakness and sadness sort of, being raised to a level of hysteria or fetishization or something. I, I, I really, I don't think I quite got my head around. I mean, it, what was interesting was the reaction to it rather than the thing itself. I mean, the thing itself was not nice, but I mean, and there was sort of levels of levels of hypocrisy going on there. Uh, just from here, watching people going on about how Trump was claiming the election had been stolen. They were the very same people, it seemed to me, who for four years had been claiming in the New York Times that the election had been stolen. Um, and that they were now accusing him of that in an angry term. I mean, do you remember this thing called the resistance? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that, that this was Trump's resistance. I'm not in any way praising it, but it, it's just, you talk about a beached whale. It's a hip, there's a hypocrisy at the heart of your empire at the moment, which I think may eat away at it quite deeply. I think uh, the, the thing that the resistance liberals really were mad about and more resented than were mad about about uh, Trump's claim of election fraud is that the people who he told that to cared enough to actually try to do something about it. I mean, obviously, it ended up being kind of a sad pantomime, but they were certainly more, more uh, charged and energized and, and believed deeper than, than uh, the people, the, 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 uh, t- the cable news addicts that the resistance were able to convince to basically just tweet yeah 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 there were three years where the like mainstream line was russia outright stole this like another country installed a leader and he is purposely weakening this country and weakening nato from the inside and the response was to like photoshop him like sucking a cock or something (laughs) i know there, there, yeah, there is a very funny montage that you have towards the end of the series of uh, clips from MSNBC and CNN of people saying the phrase, the walls are closing in on him over and over and over again. <laughs> Which also tells you a lot about journalism and how that's become <laughs> an echo chamber of its own. But I mean, there is, I mean, you talk about the empire. The, there is something interesting here is that it doesn't necessarily mean that your empire is over. It, what, what it may mean, I mean, the British Empire went through these stages. That doesn't mean that history repeats itself. But the British Empire had a thing called an informal imperialism, which is basically where it let its companies go and run places like India. Then the natives got restless and started rising up. And they start, the British started what was called formal imperialism, where you just basically send the gunboats in. You may yet, America is still very strong. You know, and one of the things, the other things I'm, I'm, I was arguing in these films is that countries like China, which many people on both right and left, think is the future, may be far weaker and far more fragile than you think. There isn't an obvious... I mean, the most strongest cultural country is South Korea, quite frankly, you know, which now occupies the places in people's imaginations that America used to in, I don't know, the 1890s. You're still very strong. What I'm trying to get my head around is, is why has there been this paralysis of the strongest country in the world? It, it, it's a mystery to me. Well, you, you bring up China, and I mean, just talk about the, the the series as a whole. I mean, in its most basic form, it's kind of a history of America, Great Britain, Russia, and China from the late 1950s right up to the very present minute, uh, told through the life stories of a number of different people. 
and the ideas, places, and events that shape their lives and the world we're living in today. Uh, if there's a main character to the series, or at least the first half of the series, it's Jiang Qing, who was an actress of stage and screen who became Mao's wife. And if you're somebody who knows very little or nothing at all about this person, who was probably one of the most powerful women in history, if not the most, her story will probably be the most fascinating to you. So how did you come to feature her as a subject of this series? And how does, how, what do you see in her life that illustrates one of your big themes, which is the tension between individualism and collectivism? Well, that's one of the things I'm following. In the, in the, I mean, the, the overall I, trajectory of ideas in these films is from the collapse, collapse of a collectivism, the rise of individualism, the rise within individualism of the desire to change the world, the collapse of that and the possibility that I raise at the end that maybe something else is coming, that, that you know, individualism may have just been one phase. I chose her, first of all, because she's a fantastic story. I mean, she's absolutely fascinating. Secondly, because as a journalist, I'm fed up with the way journalism today increasingly just divides people into goodies and baddies. You know, you're, you're either someone who's suffering from a warlord, in which case you're a good person, or you're a warlord who's banking all their money in uh, the city of London, in which case you're a bad person. I'm fed up with that. And I want to try and do a thing which has felt much more like one of those 19th century multi-part novels, where you have characters who in themselves are completely ambiguous. So you're right. She was she, she was an actor, Zhang Qing, in, in the 1930s in the Shanghai studios, she was put down, scorned um, and abused. I don't mean physically abused, just mentally abused by many of the directors and the studio heads. She was absolutely furious with this. And you're sympathetic about that. You know, she she's the she's one of the early people of what we all are now is we want to be individuals. She wanted power on her own terms. So she goes off, joins the communist revolution then she becomes Mao's mistress, and then wants he wants to marry her. The other male revolutionaries leading the revolution do everything they can to stop her. They even send her off um, to be locked up in a sanatorium in Moscow. And she's absolutely furious about this. And she has this wonderful phrase, which I just think sums up, well, to be honest, all of us today. In the communist revolution, because of the, you needed collective power, everyone was in what was called a unit. And she said, I am a unit of one. And that's it. And I think that's what we all are today. We don't want to be in collective groups. We are units of one. And she's this fantastic character. You're sympathetic with her up to that point. And then once she gets in charge of the Cultural Revolution, the demons in her own head come out and she uses it to take revenge on everyone who had held her back, including killing them. At which point you think, well, she's not very nice. But by doing that and playing with an ambiguous character like that in a story like this, you get much more of an insight into what are the problems with changing the world than you do with the goodies and baddies approach. And that's why I chose her, as well as being just, she's this fantastic story. Um, there's, there's another quote uh, from her uh, towards, towards the, the end of her story, and I don't want to give too much away, but um, in, an, in an address to you know, her uh, persecutors, she says, I am without heaven and am a law unto myself. And that also really stuck with me as well. But like, what, what was it about her, her personality and, and or just like her, her, her view of revolution that was so dangerous to the communist ideal and to the, the men who were so suspicious of her? Because it undermined co collectivism. I mean, the, the, the old idea of political change and to be honest, the old idea of mass democracy is that you as a politician assemble groups of people together. And once you've got enough of them together, you have a collective power. That, that enables you to smash through the old, unelected, undemocratic power, and it allows you to change the world. The old revolutionaries, who were horrible men, saw something truthfully in her, that that, that unit of one attitude was going to eat away and corrode at that idea of collective power and would destroy their ability to change things. And she did. And, that, and I think that's one of the great, interesting, central things of our time, not just in China, but in your country and in mine, is that mass democracy produced collective power, which enabled politicians to change the world. But it also gave birth to individualism. And it's seen, individualism is seen as the child of, of mass democracy. It is. But then somewhere in the 1990s, I argue in this film, late 80s, early 90s, that child's turned around and started to eat mass democracy. 
And what we've got now is not really mass democracy. It's a system that has been set up to try and manage this really weird force of individualism, where we're all like little squealing piglets, all going our own little way. And that, that what it's demolished is that idea that politicians can actually assemble us together and use that power to smash and challenge those unelected representatives of, I don't know, finance, uh, large computer companies. So we're, in a sense, we're all free little squealing piglets, but we're powerless. And the politicians have realized this. And a feature of that that you bring up is that, you know, with with individual freedom and if, if with just individualism, it, 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 it's good. It feels great. You feel like you're you're free to express yourself, be yourself. But when something terrible happens or when catastrophe or ba- or something like bad happens to you personally, if all you have is individualism, what you find is that you're actually very alone and very afraid. Yeah, I think that that's its weakness. It's I mean, the, it's very much like. Collectivism is like going into the woods at night with your friends. It's really exciting. Individualism is like going into the woods at night on your own. It's sort of exciting for a bit. Then then you hear a twig snap and it's really scary. It's really frightening and you run. Individualism has that problem. And I argue in these films is that it ate away at the collective power of politicians during the 90s. In response to that, the politicians turned to finance and to managerialist systems to try and manage and contain this sort of weird force that was emerging. And then that worked very well until 2008, when the global financial crash led to that system beginning to collapse. And it's been flatlining ever since. But it also made us feel very scared and alone. And I think a lot of the hysteria that we were talking about right at the beginning of the show sort of has its roots in that scaredness of individualism, the sense of aloneness and not knowing really what's going to happen tomorrow. And also thinking there isn't anyone in power who knows what's going to happen tomorrow, that we're all individuals and we're all on our own and we're all a bit scared. And that leads to really strange hysterical stories and conspiracy theories rising up on both left and right. Well, I mean, in, in talking about the 90s um, and like your, your portrayal of like the Clinton and Blair years in America and Great Britain, um, an- another idea communicated in this movie is that there, you know, there are these old fears and this very real anger created by political systems in America and Great Britain that are been based on violence and exploitation at a really astonishing level that keep asserting themselves. And there's a very real and justified anger of the people outside of the cities at the elites that keeps coming back. But the idea here is that thanks to like liberal politicians during the 90s, like who, you know, even for sincere and altruistic reasons, have created a world in which even if they wanted to do something about the problems people are angry at them about, they couldn't because they explicitly gave away their power to institutions and bureaucracy that were explicitly designed to be completely independent of mass democratic will or consent. And here I'm talking about, yeah, like like banks, the EU. And yeah, these the technology companies and, and data. Yes, that's true. But but to be fair to the politicians, which is probably wrong, but, it, but to try and be fair to the politicians, they did that because we gave up wanting to join political parties. Right. We removed ourselves from the arena of mass democracy and instead became expressive units of one, like Zhang Qing said. And in that, at that point, the politicians realized their power had gone. So they literally, they did a 180 degree switch and they became the representatives of those groups because, not because they were well, partly in order to keep their sense of status and power, but also because they thought in, almost unconsciously, how the hell do you manage these, these massive individuals? And that was the system. The 90s was this strange dream world. I don't think we've still got to come to terms with the 90s yet. Uh, it, it sort of floated through and then came 9-11 and then came the global economic crash, both of which sort of exposed the weakness of that individualism. But during the 90s, that's what happened, is you flooded money into that system of millions of individuals and allowed them to buy a dream world. And that went worked until 2008. But outside, you're right, outside that system, if you lived in, I don't know, West Virginia, where I've been to, and those those towns there where the factories closed and there was nothing, you felt very alone and very isolated, just as we feel alone and isolated now since 2008. From about 92 onwards, they were feeling that, and there was this anger building up. The same was true in my country up in the north. 
real fury, real anger. I mean, the politicians and the, cl- and the class of think tank people who surround politics at the moment still do not realise how angry people here in my country got after the banking crash in 2008. It had an enormous effect because they tra- the government simply transferred what was a private debt by paying off the banks onto the public. And people are not stupid. They may not understand economic theory, but they could see exactly what was happening. And they realised that the people who, the politicians who once pretended, said they represented them, really no longer did. They represented something else. And they got very angry. And and that built up and up and up. And in the film, I put in a, a bit from a speech by Steve Bannon, which all my liberal friends would hate me for doing. But it's fascinating because he sounds like a radical Marxist arguing exactly that, that a class of politicians was appropriated by unelected forces and gave up representing people, which, you know, is pretty shocking. And just like another another element to this is that like in in the 90s, the the height of of kind of a liberal era, a liberal utopia almost, in giving away their power to global financial system, but also the American military through this idea of humanitarian intervention. And that, like you said, in a world of only unique individuals, that it's the responsibility of governments and their military to save individuals from the pe- other individuals who are oppressing them. But in doing so, let's it just, what are we talking about here? Giving all power to global financial systems and the military just like the grand old days of empire in the 19th century, just as the 21st century begins again. But that's because we did that. Sorry, we allowed that to happen because we had given up not only talking about, but even thinking about power. I mean, it goes back to the goodies and baddies thing. It wasn't just journalism that divided the world into goodies and baddies. It was the politicians. I mean, the main culprit for this is my ex-prime minister, Tony Blair. He wanted to go to Iraq because he would bought into that idea that the world was simply divided into millions of innocent individuals who were, in inverted commas, good, and evil, bad dictators who were bad. And if you went in and you got rid of the evil, bad person, then all the millions of individuals would rise up and you'd get democracy. What happened when he and the Americans went in there is that they removed the bad person and what was revealed was a really complex power structure with all kinds of rivalries and groups and classes, all the things that in the age of the individual we had forgotten about the complexities of power. And we still haven't got our heads around it because power is not discussed any longer. And one of the things I point to in the films as well is that in the age of the individual, what also rose up to manage us was a whole kind of psychology which said, if you feel bad inside yourself, it's your fault. And what we can do is help you, manage you in the kindest and nicest of ways to bring you back, make you feel better and thus fit within the system. What was forgotten was the old idea of why you feel bad. That, you know, if you're living in West Virginia or in the north of my country and you're feeling really bad, it's not because of your fault. It's because you're living in a really bad system. If you're feeling shit, it's because it's a shit system. And that was forgotten about, that idea, except for the people outside. We bought into this idea that somehow everything you feel comes from inside you. A lot of it does. That's completely true. But a lot of it is also where you are in the power structure. And the interesting thing about the COVID pandemic is that it has made blatantly clear how the closer you are to the centres of power, the system of power, or the higher up the hierarchy of power today, the safer you are and the less likely you are to die. And I think that, like the banking crisis, is going to have a very big effect on people, especially those people outside the system of power. I mean, this gets into another huge theme in the series, which is uh, the machine thinking and artificial intelligence and these attempts to kind of recreate and replicate the human brain inside machines and turn over management of society to them. You talk about something called complexity theory, and you describe it as the most powerful mythology of our age. Like, what, what is con- complexity theory? Like, where did it come out of? And what are some of the sort of terrifying implications of, of ordering our society around it? Complexity theory really came out at the end of the Cold War with the rise of computers. It was, it's, the, it's the early mythology that says that computers can understand the complexity of the world more than you human beings can, which I would argue is one of the great... You've heard the phrase big data. 
that somehow big data can understand the world better than we can, that we're limited human beings. It's a, in a funny way, it's quite a religious view. It says that there is something that knows us and the world more than we do, which of course is God. It, but it was born out of that idea that came out of the Cold War, which said, no, the computer systems that ran that complex system of the Cold War were really powerful. And we can then use that to actually analyse the data and then manage the world better. The problem with it is that it, it made one fundamental assumption. It, it said, we can look at the data and work out how to manage the system better. What it cannot do is ask the question of in whose benefit that system has been designed. It just wants to keep it running. It has no way of analysing or even perceiving whether that system's good or bad, which is actually what politics should be about. But instead, the politicians sold their soul to that idea that these systems could manage complexity, i.e. us, squealing piglets, better than they could. At which point they gave up the ability to look at the system you have around you and say, this system isn't good. You see, I would argue that people like Hillary Clinton are not bad people. And the technocrats around her and the think tanks around her, they're not bad people. They had just bought into this idea that this system was going to be here forever. And you had to find a way of managing it. Do you remember the phrase they used to use in the late 90s? It was called the Goldilocks economy. It was neither too hot nor too cold. It was just going to go on forever. And they bought into this idea that things would go on forever. I mean, it was this really, really, really strange. It was outside time in a way. And, 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 and I think one of the strongest mythologies of that is this idea that if you can just assemble enough information about the world, you can keep it like that forever. What was ignored was the great forces of history roaring on outside, which, which begat has, I, I still don't think it's over yet, just, has just started to come knocking at the door. Trump was that. Uh, Black Lives Matter was that. It, it'll come back. It, it's, it hasn't gone away. I mean, but contained in that in 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 this idea of that, like only only the data can see reality because it's only the, only it can analyze the the patterns of what really matter about human beings, which is not our thoughts, not our feelings, memories, relationships. It is only our behavior in, in this market in in these systems. But also contained in that idea is this idea that any attempt to change that system or to predict the future is doomed to fail because it is just too dangerous for human beings to to contemplate or even attempt something when you're dealing with a system as complex as human human beings in general. Yes, it's too complex. So therefore you mustn't touch it, which is one of the great mythologies of our time. You must have heard it, that that it's too difficult, it's too dangerous to, to change things because it's too complex. You can never tell the outcomes of it all. Look what happened with communism. Look to what happened with fascism. That's true. They led. They both led to horror. What is neglected in that argument is that there are many other things born out of extraordinary, dramatic visions of the future. I mean, your country, America, was born out of a, a great story. There are many things wrong with your country, but it's an extraordinary achievement. The welfare state in my country was born out of, of a sort of strong vision of the future. The mass democracy was born out of that. It's, it's a very partial view, but it became very, very, very powerful. But it's weaknesses. That, and you're right. It's all about giving up on the idea of individual feelings and just observing people as though they're components in a system and then be able to predict what they do. Its weakness is that it doesn't tell you or I any visions of the future. It doesn't tell us what this is all for. What's this all about? So when it goes bad and we get frightened, we we start inventing our own stories to fill in that vacuum. And that's the weakness of this system. It has no story of what's coming tomorrow. And it has no explanation of why something bad happens. So it's, that's why we all see, feel so anxious and fragmented at the moment. And, and unless, to go back to the people who were so angry with Donald Trump and with Brexit, unless they come up with an alternative, those dark, dangerous, nationalistic stories are going to come in and fill the void. Well, I mean, I guess uh, this would be a good time to bring up another character uh, in the series, uh, Edward Limanov. Uh, a fairly notorious character who, uh, before this series, I was really only familiar with because I, I feel like I'm constantly being accused of being part of his red, red brown alliance and Nazbol political ideology. Strangely enough, a guy in you know 21st century uh, New York City uh, could have some connection to, 
<laughs> to a political <laughs> party he founded in Russia. But anyway, the, the, he's the founder of the National Bolshevik Party and has been, you know, sort of a thorn in the side of the Soviet Union, Yeltsin and Putin. But how, how does he fit into this idea of like uh, in a world dominated by money? And the meaninglessness and nihilism that that engenders. Like, how did he, he? He turned to these these old ideas as kind of a weapon to attack and smash, like you said, directly at the heart of the weakness of of this world of only money that is covered up by democracy. Edward Limonov, I just found again he was like Zhang Qing. I just found him a fascinating and ambiguous character because his early life, he's, he's a dissident in in the Soviet Union in the seventies. They kick him out and they send him off to New York City. And he, en- he ends up in New York City at the height of the punk era and becomes this completely destitute figure. He then writes this extraordinary novel called It's Me, Eddie. It's one of the first of those sort of novels in which the novelist becomes the central character. Um, and it's a picture of America just as finance is rising up and the old idea of state management and the politicians are declining in the 1970s. It's an absolutely fascinating book. And it... It's then published in America, in uh, Russia in the 80s and becomes incredibly influential. And you're again with him, you're really sympathetic to him because he sees something in America. He sees how actually people in America, he says, are like robots who are just following the rules of money. They think they're fascinating, complex individuals, but actually they've been simplified by judging everything in terms of whether it can be bought or sold. There's nothing else, he says. And, it, and in a way, his book was warning the Soviet, the people in Russia, what was coming. When he then comes back to Russia in the 90s and finds that that money has come into Russia and has corrupted everything and everyone, he decides, he sees that weakness, which I was just talking about, which is that that system of finance and managerialism is very strong and very powerful because we as individuals have lost power. And we've just become these little atomized creatures and don't have that collective power to challenge it. He sees that, but he knows that its weakness is it doesn't have any stories to tell. So what he does is he begins to, he's one of the earliest people to begin to go back and say, let's revive the old nationalist myths. And he creates this party called the National Bolsheviks Party, where he deliberately fuses fascism and um, communism. I mean, the flag, like the flag itself is such like like it's such a fuck you to like everything because it's essentially the hammer and sickle inside the Nazi flag. But what's but really what interesting you know, about like, it, yeah, yeah. is the Nazbols, okay. as they were called, yeah. is that they weren't, oh, the, the were at the same time old nostalgic communists. He wasn't like that at all, um, Monov. He was, in a way, trying to go back to the original modernist roots of fascism. I'm not praising him at all, but what he saw was it had that power to excite people. That it gave you the energy. I mean, what because what the early roots of fascism said. He was fascinated by a man called Danunzio, uh, Gabriel Danunzio, who's who was one of the early fascists in Italy, who said, "Look, human beings have the power to make the world anything they want. It's the most exciting idea in the world." And Limonov realized that that was a thing that that was the thing that could challenge this managerialist system, which said, "No, no, no, we never change the world. We just keep it as it is. And if you're feeling shit, it's your fault." And that's it. He realised that that was the, the sort of the thing that could push into it. And the reason I took Lomonov seriously to begin with is that one the, the third member of his Nazbol party, the third person to join it, was a musician I've always loved called Yegor Letov from the 1980s, who was one of early Siberian punk musicians. And I just thought he was brilliant. And I thought, if he's joining that party, there's something really interesting about it. And that's when I started reading about Lomonov. He tell like all the char- many other characters in these films, he tells you something about your time, but he isn't a very nice person. But he's sort of a truth teller. And I rather, I'm, I just thought that was a really interesting way to look at our time, rather than just having goodies and baddies. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, there's a, the goodie and baddie dichotomy there because he is very, uh, very smart and funny and kind of uh, just you know, venomous in, in, in his, his way of looking at the world. But then, of course, then he meets with <laughs> Serbian nationalists and fires a machine gun into Sarajevo on, on news footage. And you're sort of like, oh, okay. He's not a very nice <laughs> yeah. man. But on the other hand, though, he, when you read his novel, It's Me, Eddie, about New York in the 1970s, it tells you something about America, which just pulls you back like a helicopter. You go, oh, yeah, actually, that's really interesting. Well, okay. Speaking of his his, his vision of uh, sort of a world dominated by money and and people in democracies essentially being being robots, uh, the next thing I want to ask you about is 
not a person, but a, a motif that comes up again and again in your, in your films. And I'm talking about images of people dancing. And I remember all the way back in uh, The Power of Nightmares, uh, there's a scene where you talk about a part in Saeed Kateb's memoirs, where he writes about a revelation that he had uh, attending a college dance in Colorado in the 1950s. And it was this vivid moment of horror for him about what the West truly represented. And like that has always kind of stuck with me in my head whenever dancing shows up in your movies, because it's always vaguely disquieting. Uh, you, you, there are people in nightclubs, on stage, with a partner, either in free form or these kind of mass choreographed movements. Uh, for you, do you find the, the image of people dancing, does this sort of reflect the ideas you're kind of communicating about this individualism and how people see themselves and how they actually behave? Because, you know, dance is an expression of the self, the body, movement, freedom. But in another sense, it's also totally programmed and not of ourselves, but in fact, sort of coming from some, somewhere else, something controlling us almost. Yeah, that's right. That's why I do do it. Okay, got it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so wish. I would never normally talk about it like that, but that's, yeah, privately, that's exactly why I do put them in, because I think, again, it's a very ambiguous thing to look at. I mean, the, the underlying thing in the age of, the, of individualism, the age of the self that we've all lived through, is... Whilst at the same, whilst on the one hand, we are very free and we're very conscious that we are free and that we can express ourselves, there is also a deep sense of self-consciousness in our time, which I think previous ages didn't really have. I mean, I know they were self-conscious in other ways, but there is a sense that you get throughout all this, and I've never managed to get this into a film because I don't know how to express it, is that people have a sense they're being watched, and you get this online all the time. That, that people behave as though they are being watched, even if they're not. Dancing is this really strange moment, because on the one hand, it's that moment when many people give up that sense of self-consciousness and really let themselves be what they are. But at the same time, you're right. They're dancing within a quite a pre-programmed, you know, everyone... Every DJ knows the, the range of beats per minute that you can work with. It, it changes through the decades. Uh, and... Rather like the characters in the films, dancing is exactly the same ambiguous thing. It's, on the one hand, it's the moment when you are looking at people truly being themselves, and it's wonderful and it's glorious. There are, there's a right at the bit, of, one of the characters at the end called Julia, I have her dancing in a club, and it's just beautiful. It's just lovely. You, you're watching someone you want to cry. Whereas there are other moments when there are people just dancing, and you feel a bit like Limonyov said, they think they're free, but they're like robots in a system. And it's that, again, that paradox of our time is that we feel completely free, but what we don't see are the tendrils of others, of the systems of power that sort of hold us together. There's a Chinese science fiction writer who I really like called Liu Chichin, who said once, what, what we don't realise is that we're always dancing in chains. And that's I, I get that, is that we're dancing, but there are chains that are holding us sometimes gently and sometimes beautifully, but it, that's how power works in these days. There are these invisible chains around us, and sometimes dancing shows that, and sometimes it shows people freeing themselves from those chains. to uh, another one of the main characters of, of, of this series and, and, and two people that will probably be most familiar to, to our audience and an American audience are Afeni and Tupac Shakur. Um, how, do the, how, do, how does the life of this woman and her son uh, illustrate the shift in revolutionary ideals from the realm of politics to what you call the artificial terrain of culture? Yeah, I always get in a lot of trouble with this one. Um, yeah, I mean, people get if you're, if fans of Tupac's music might get, might get mad at you for this one, Adam. I mean, when I've I've sort of tried gently to suggest 
other times that maybe culture isn't the radical force that people think it is, that maybe it's, <laughs> it's actually one of the conservative forces of our time. And I get in much more trouble with that. But Afeni Shaka is really the hero of these films. Her and, yeah. and, and Julia, the person, other person I was talking about, she showed, I don't want to give too much away, but she was a Black Panther and she, an incredible, she was put on trial for allegations of planning with her cell of Black Panthers to plant bombs in New York. And she defended herself and she proved that actually they'd all been set up by agents, um, undercover agents who were within the cell to do the bombings. And she did it so powerfully and so strongly. Um, the transcripts of, of what she says are amazing. It's And how she gets the, the um, undercover agents to actually admit at the end that, that what they thought she and the other Panthers were really doing was incredible, beautiful, and wonderful, even though they tried to set up the bombings. It, it, it's an extraordinary moment, and it shows that an individual can stand up and take on that system, and it was amazing. I mean, it, it, it's really good, and she's the sort of hero of that. She, I don't want to give too much away, but if you jump on then to, to Tupac Shakur, when he comes and becomes, he realises at the end of the 80s that, that, that although many things have changed, the racism in America was still incredibly deep, much deeper than, than people thought. And he decided to try and revive the Black Panthers. But I found this extraordinary interview with him when he's talking about going to a party in the late 80s and realising this and wanting to bring back the Black Panthers. But he decides to do it through culture. And I'm afraid, I, I, I don't want to go into it too too much because it, 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 we're giving much, too much of his story. But I think what he discovered was that culture had become this arena in which you could act out being radical. And and you all felt very radical and then really nothing ever changed, which is sort of true. I mean, it's 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 one of the great mysteries of, of, of our time is the way the left retreated into cu- radical culture, in inverted commas, at a time when actually inequalities, uh, the structure of power became much more rigid, much worse, and has done very little to change it. It's sort of, it, it, it's always baffled me, this one. It doesn't mean that that culture isn't very good and it it doesn't express its time beautifully, but it may be actually expressing its time beautifully in its very inability to change the world. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Rather than its rhetoric. And that sometimes you have to look at art and think, actually, what it really expresses is something that those who were, were doing it at the time didn't even really realise. And, I mean, it, it is very... I think Tupac Shakur got very angry when he began to realise, he, when he was put in jail, you know, a third of the way through the 90s, is that he realised that actually he was being locked away in culture as well. Uh, and, and, and I don't know, I think it's... I just have this theory that we may look back at culture as the way in which this system managed radicalism. It, it, it created this lovely little nursery in which everyone could go and be radical. And this goes back to the question you, I asked at the end of the last time we talked, which is, do you really want change? Is that if you really want to have a revolution in your country or in my country, then you would have to accept that maybe you'd lose power. And not only would you lose power, you might actually lose your income. You might have to lose your status. You might have to lose a lot of the things that make your life so happy. You might lose your life. You might lose your life like people have done in the past when they have fought to change the world, but they did it because they believed they were part of something bigger than themselves and wanted this to go on beyond their own existence. In the age of the individual, no one thinks like that any longer. No one does. They marched through London against the Iraq war saying, not in my name. Mm-hmm. No one thought about that in, in, in revolutions. It, it's it's the, uh, to go back to the corrosive effect of individualism it eats away at that collective power that can give people the possibility of change in the world. But on the other hand, though, we don't want to be in a collective. We want to be free individuals. It's wonderful. It's lovely. But it limits us. And as you said earlier on, when, it, when things go bad, you feel alone and very weak. Pick up another, another, another big thread in this movie, and one that, one that fascinated me a lot, was okay. So the, another character is this guy named Carrie Thornley who is this sort of pseudo-objectivist who, along with a friend of his in Playboy magazine, starts something called Operation Mindfuck, which was the genesis of the Illuminati conspiracy theory in American culture. But for him, uh, when he created it, 
it was a totally satirical attempt to illustrate the absurdity of all conspiracy theories. What you show here, uh, how did Operation Mindfuck achieve the exact opposite of its intended effect, both in the public imagination, but in the mind of the very man who created it himself? Again, I don't want to give too much away, but Thorne, it is, it is fascinating, the, the, the role of, of fake conspiracy theories and real conspiracies, how they got mixed up together in your country. It, 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 it is absolutely fascinating. Thornley, you're right, was a follower of Ayn Rand. He believed that all conspiracy theories were a, just a way of actually making people feel weak because you don't know who to trust. Um, and, and he set up Operation Mindfuck as a way... He was part of a, the, the prankster counterculture, to give it its best term. And he, he decided he was going to parody all conspiracy theories by putting, starting in Playboy magazine, but all through the counterculture, spreading the story that all the chaos, all the assassinations of the 1960s were the work of the Illuminati, who were really the secret rulers of the world. He just thought this was so ridiculous that no one would believe it and it would parody it. As that spread through the counterculture in the late 60s, early 1970s, what also began to be revealed was that Actually, ever since the 1950s, the American government had been doing conspiracies. It had been doing secretly assassinating leaders of other countries around the world with things like poison toothpastes and, and dart, strange poison dart guns. Whilst at the same time at home, they'd also been trying to experiment with mind control on their own citizens without telling them. When that started to come out, those were seen as so absurd but true, people began to get confused about what because of the level of, of absurdity of these conspiracies, with the absurd conspiracy theories. And what I try and show in the films is how those two got mixed up together. And ever since the 1970s, that began to blur the line between what was true and what was false. And I think when you then get the internet coming along from late, late 90s, that just explodes. And, and you see it, I would argue, both in QAnon and in the uh, Russiagate, everyone falls into the, the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories because that crucial line got eaten away out of the counterculture attempts to parody things when they actually met really abs real absurd conspiracies. Because the great distinction is that conspiracy theories and conspiracies are very different things. But we, we've forgotten that these days. Yeah, I mean, QAnon obviously is, is, is the most um, sort of cutting edge of these because it is this... It's this crowdsourced attempt that like comes from an, an anonymous individual or individuals that is just like seeding these 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 cryptic little things that then masses millions of people then take it upon themselves to interpret and create their own stories and 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 you narratives do the work. with yeah like do the work it's 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 this this crowdsourced attempt to investigate not just a, a satanic cabal of pedophiles running the government like that's that's almost incidental I think it's really become a an attempt to investigate what is reality itself and can an individual know anything about it or interpreting any of these signals or data that we're getting now. And it has taken on an entire life of its own that, I mean, it just, it's, it seems like something exactly, I don't want to hear movie, movies and it's a tiny part of, the, of this new documentary, but I, I guess like, I'm just wondering like, where, where do you see this going? I don't think it's as important as you think it is. Okay. I think that's one of the, the mythologies. Sorry, I'm not, trying to be rude here, but I think it, it is one of the mythologies of the liberals that conspiracy theories are terribly dangerous. When I started to investigate um, some of the conspiracy theories that people believe online, like the fact that Beyonce and Britney Spears are actually have been mind controlled by the CIA uh, using MK Ultra techniques, what you begin to find with people who believe, believe them, in inverted commas, is that they sort of know they're not that true, but they love them because they are yeah. epic and wonderful and dreamlike, and they take you into some kind of world which this present system of power doesn't give you because it's so banal. Like, like that, it's the power of a big story, right? Like it's sort of what you're saying, like a power of like a story to tell, so, communicate some truth about about the present and about the future that it that is big and captures people's imaginations. And it's sort of like the truth of it is almost irrelevant. Hillary Clinton did not capture anyone's imagination. <laughs> No way, no. You're going too far, Adam. Calm down. <laughs> Whereas the idea that Britney Spears has been mind-controlled by an alliance between the Illuminati, the CIA, and Walt Disney, but it only lasts for seven years, which is why it, it goes at certain points and she goes mad. 
is a sort of epic and weird and wonderful story that people sort of know is probably not true, but it's just you go into that world because what you're faced by is a strange mixture of technocrats like Hillary Clinton who have no story to tell you and genuine conspiracies like the weapons of mass destruction. That was not a conspiracy theory. That, you could argue, allegedly, was a conspiracy by high-up people within government to actually justify an illegal invasion. So when you've got a world like that, why not go and believe that Britney Spears is controlled by MK Ultra, even if you don't, in inverted commas, really believe it? What I'm trying to say is that the lib- this goes back to goodies and baddies. The liberal and left-wing attitude to those who believe in conspiracy theories is that they're stupid because they're believing in something that, you know. No, there's a, the moment you start investigating people who believe those kind of conspiracy theories, yes, of course, there are some very stupid people who believe it all, but there's actually something much more sophisticated going on, really. And, 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 and actually, the really stupid people are the ones who then go and try and believe that, that actually Vladimir Putin gave you Donald Trump and, is comp- and completely ignore the elephant in the centre of the room that is peering around the edges, which is that actually millions and millions of people are really angry and really fed up and were given a big button that just said fuck off and they pressed it, which is Donald Trump and Brexit, and they would not face it. There's something really sophisticated going on. I mean, but also what QAnon was also a way of those on the right justifying why Donald Trump did nothing because he was being stopped yeah. by lots of paedophiles in Washington. So it's obvious. That's why he wasn't doing anything. This, I mean, and you touched on this as well. I mean, we've talked about this on the show as well, like in, in not just to blaming conspiracy theories for the rise of Donald Trump or something like Brexit. A lot of like in, in, in the media and among intellectuals, a big, a big thing you hear a lot about now is like a, as, as a reason for why people vote the wrong way or have bad beliefs in their head is this idea of misinformation, that there's so much that they're being directly controlled through like targeted misinformation through the internet that if only they got better information or more responsible mediators of that information, these things wouldn't happen. Yeah. Well, I don't believe that. Do you? No. I mean, well, I mean, this gets into, I think, one of the more hopeful parts of, of the movie, which is saying a lot, is that according, according to what you like, your interpretation of like the latest like neuroscience on this issue is cutting against what was the dominant belief of like the last half century or so that pe- that human beings as individuals are fundamentally weak and easily manipulated. And what you're saying is that like new information would seem to imply just just the opposite. Yes, I do think it's really interesting. It's one of the underreported things of, of recent times is that over the last few years, psychological ex- researchers have tried to repeat many of the major experiments that we have been used to justify this argument of what that they call it priming, that you can prime people or nudge them, they, you also use the phrase, by sending them, targeting them with messages that unconsciously can actually affect their, the way they think and behave. When they tried to repeat many of these experiments, they found they couldn't do it. And it, it, it's a the really big questions being asked in, in psychology at the moment about whether this whole idea of human beings is fundamentally manipulable, is not true. That you can keep people in a state of hysteria online by sending lots of memes around all the time. But what you can't do is fundamentally alter how they think and how they feel. That it, uh, that it means that people might have voted for Donald Trump and for Brexit because they, I mean, they might have been misguided. And they might be wrong, but they might have done it because they believed in it. Or, they, or, in a more sophisticated way, they saw it in an age when the mainstream of political parties had sort of become a monopoly simple system in which there were no alternatives. They saw it as the only way they could register their anger, which is a sophisticated reading. And maybe they were far more sophisticated than we think. I didn't believe in Brexit. I wouldn't have voted for Donald Trump, but I can see why they did it. And for the last four years, those who were so angry with this refused to actually face up to that question of why did they do it? Instead, they're, 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 either, they're either stupid or they have been manipulated, which, of course, you would never be manipulated. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Like, no, I'm, I'm not the object of propaganda. I can't be propagandized to. I'm, I don't even, I, no one even bothers to because, you know, I'm smart. I'm, I'm, of the, I'm of the group of people that, like, you know, doesn't fall for that kind of thing. Well, I mean, if you believe that, like, chances are you're absolutely <laughs> the victim of propaganda. You're back to a sort of, a sort of class distinction here between those who yeah. can be manipulated 
who are not you, and those who can't be manipulated who are you. And I just think that's quite a dangerous line to start drawing. Um, I, I like that. There's, a, there's an interesting Russian journalist who works for The New Yorker called Masha Gaston, who's consistently said, no, the, 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 Vladimir Putin did not elect Donald Trump. She put it very simply. She said, Russians did not elect Donald Trump. Americans elected Donald Trump. And they cannot get their heads around this fact. And I think that says a lot about... I think this is one of the things that's just gently coming back into focus in this age of individualism, especially in this country. But I think it's also true in yours is maybe social class never really went away. And that sense of entitlement and superiority never really went away. It just lived under the surface quietly while, we, while, while everyone radical, behaved as radicals in the area of culture. Social class and elitism carried on unquestioned. And, and, and it's sort of come out and people like Trump and Brexit have brought it out in a rather raw and frightening way. I mean, it, it's, it's this idea about um, manipulating or priming people. It's, it's sort of very similar to the idea of hypnotism and what the CIA actually did find out with their MK Ultra programs is that you cannot actually hypnotize someone to do anything that they would otherwise be morally opposed to. That's a very good point. Back in 19, whatever it was, 58, they discovered that you cannot actually alter how people behave. And the, psych the failure to repeat psychology, psychology experiments 60 years later, 50 years later, are showing exactly the same thing. That doesn't mean that people can't be sold things through advertising. It doesn't mean people can't be kept in a state of what's called high arousal emotions online. But, but underneath, the, there's something much deeper in human beings, which is they actually have a conscious understanding of what they think and what they believe, depending on their experience, where they are in the power structure, their quality of life they actually are much stronger than you think, which gives me great optimism because if we could recapture that, if we could get that confidence back, then actually you might be able to keep the world of the individualism. It's not going to go away. You can't go back into the old collectivism. Yet at the same time, begin to give people confidence to really try and challenge power and do things and change the world properly rather than patronising them all the time and telling them they're stupid, which I just think is wrong. Well, I guess, I mean, this gets into my, I guess, my last question for you, it, which is that, you know, this, this whole, this whole idea about like living in the age of individualism, that it is, it is the dominant hegemonic ethos of our times. But at the same time, like, you know, in, in our lifetimes or like, you know, as you show in the movie, the, the idea of like our sense of confidence in ourselves as individuals or even, as even being able in charge of our own minds has been steadily chipped away at. And I guess I'm wondering, like, to regain a sense of confidence um, in ourselves, or at least our ability to oppose these kind of systems of management and control, is our confidence as individuals in conflict with the idea of individualism as like a prim primary goal or ideal in our society? I think what I'm quietly underneath these films suggesting that really we've lived through an age of individualism that came out of the Second World War and the horrors of those collect of collectivism like fascism like communist totalitarianism, it has been a glorious and wonderful and liberating time. It, it, it's been a time in history like unlike anything else. It has all its problems and it had lots of other things that were wrong with it, but it was a moment of great liberation. But it is very strange that what started off as an idea of empowerment has now led in America and throughout the West and in China and Russia, to a sense of millions and millions of individuals feeling anxious and uncertain and frightened about the future. And those in power having nothing to offer to explain to them how to get out of that. That's You get a sense that something might be at the end of its natural life. But what I also know is that you can't put individualism back in the box. And what we're waiting for is something or someone or some idea, some vision of the future, which says, no, I can square the circle. I can actually create a system which will allow you to carry on thinking and feeling genuinely that you are a confident individual, yet also relish and like being part, the feeling of being part of something that can build something in the future, which will go on past your own existence, because that's quite thrilling and quite exciting. We're waiting for that. Part of me thinks in a practical way, the first thing to do is literally take the internet back from the people who got hold of it, the venture capitalists in about 2000 with the dot-com crash and they've skewed it and narrowed it and distorted it and screwed up journalism in the process. Take it back. 
and actually use it as a way of genuinely connecting people collectively, which was its original utopian ideas. And I've always believed in those sort of things. That was the good ideas in the 90s. That's one practical thing. But the other is just a story about the world. It doesn't have to be very complicated, but it just have to have this sense that that re- it, it's that I quote this guy called David Graeber, who is na- who is an activist um, at both at the front of the series and the end of the series, who simply said the great hidden truth about the world is that we made this world, and if we made it, then we can make it differently. And I find that really thrilling. I love that idea because we've been persuaded that we can't. Complexity theory, psychology, all those things now tell us we're weak, uncertain, and you can't do anything. But the truth is, which is really what I'm trying to demonstrate in these films, is we did make this world together. We all did. And, it, you know, we it's our responsibility for having been individuals that corroded the power of the politicians. It's the politicians' fault for having given up on the idea that you actually can challenge those in power. We did this together. And if we did that together, we can make it different together. And I think that's really quite thrilling. But the way to do that is someone's got to come along and say, yes, you can still be an individual, but you can actually work together to create something beyond this. And I I think that will happen. If it doesn't, then the horrible nationalisms and the old myths of the past are going to come back. But you don't do it by telling people they're stupid. You have to go and talk to those people who voted for Donald Trump and voted for Brexit, even if they're racist. They're not racist because they're just... Racism doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes because they're frightened and scared and angry. You've got to go and talk to those people. And you've just... You've, you've got to do it. And and the only person I ever saw do it was Bernie Sanders. He went and talked to people after Donald Trump was elected. And I thought that was quite right. Really good. It, you know, if you... <laughs> You, you can't change the world just by talking to each other and producing radical culture. I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Uh, Felix and Matt, do you have any uh, closing comments, thoughts, or questions? I think we, yeah, I think we did it. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>